And there is that. Let's see. We are live. I believe, Joe, that we are live. All right. Okay. Hey, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it's always a treat to welcome our friend Joe Lansdale to our little show. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we were we were lamenting the fact that it wasn't live this time, but Joel, I'm sure our paths will cross again soon here in the desert. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were just talking, um, but just to kick things off, I wanted to mention uh, for those of you like myself who are kind of under a rock um, and hadn't heard the news, the exciting news about developments with the thick, the movie version of the thicket. Joe, can you kind of tell us what's going on? Yeah, it's finally filming in, in Calgary. And, uh, you know, that's either, I'm not sure if the script will be East Texas as the novel was, or if it'll be somewhere else, but nonetheless, it's being filmed in Calgary as someplace in the U.S. And uh, stars Peter Dinklage, Juliette Lewis. And so I'm, I'm excited. I'm a fan of both of them. But, you know, I can't, I can't wait to see. I know, I know as much as you do about it. Uh, except that I know, you know, I found out it was filming because my um, uh, the, my daughter's boyfriend read it in Deadline, told her, and she told me, and my agent was like, we were both like, what? Because <laughs> it had been, but it, you know, it had been set for a long time for them if, whenever they chose to do it, if they did do it. And so we found out just like everybody else, I was on Deadline, then I looked it up online, and I thought, well, I'll be down. <laughs> yeah, and then... Uh metallica's james hetfield yes that's right and uh yeah they the, the, the about a year ago they had a totally different cast you know and mm -hmm. uh yeah and uh of course people had to go to work and do other things i think covid yeah. upset the filming last time and then now and it's being done for tubi which i think is interesting because tubi has decided it wants to get into movies and things like that and so you know, what better way to start with the Peter Dinklage and Juliette Lewis, oh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and the thicket. And, uh, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I hope it's good. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will you be. Know? Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I cash the check. So, you know, there's that. You know? Absolutely. That, I mean, that, that sounds like an inspired cast, you know, it does, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. Um, well, we can, we can get off and talk about, uh, about Bubba Hotep for a while later, maybe if you'll indulge me. I always like to sure. talk about that a yeah. little bit. Um, yeah, but I wanted sure. to bring up just briefly because I don't think we've talked about it since um, the tragic uh, loss of Michael K. Williams. Um, oh yeah. God damn. Awful. Yeah, you know it's uh, Michael and I weren't dear friends, but we were we were certainly friendly because of. Uh, of a uh, half and Leonard and, you know, I, I, James Purefoy too. I know James a little better, but yeah. it, it was, um, yeah, I can't say I was shocked. I was more surprised, you know, because I know, I knew he had a, a drug battle, you know, he, he was open yeah. about that. Yes. And, uh, he, he mentioned, we talked about it on set, you know, and at yeah. that point in time, I think he, well, at least he said that he was doing okay with it, but he never ever said, yeah, I got this licked or, you know, he always knew that that uh, it was a it was a monkey on his back, you know, and right. he had to deal with it. And uh, unfortunately, he he didn't deal with it. And I think a lot of us had a strange feeling. We were all just pissed off at him. You know, yeah. here's this major, really super talent, a wonderful person. You know, he plays all these bad guys. But Michael was a sweetheart. He was just a really nice man. And it was like when I when I lost my friend Bill Paxton, yeah. I just like, Jesus, really? You know? And, uh, but this was, I think in, in, in some ways they were both tragic because, uh, uh, you know, Bill's family, and this is common knowledge, so I'm not saying anything, sued that hospital because of, uh, uh, the procedure that they did wasn't exactly something everybody had agreed to, I think, but nonetheless, you know, that was tragic and unexpected. And then this was, uh, unexpected as well. Like I said, I wasn't shocked because I knew that it, there, you know, he had problems with drugs, but, um, yeah, tough. Tough stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, just a, just a, a remarkable talent. Such a oh yeah yeah. Omar on the wire, you know, you know these different roles yeah. that he played, kind of iconic, instant iconic yeah. status, sort of. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Karim uh, Abdul Jabbar said that he said, "Man, one of the most underrated, my favorite performance underrated was his Happen Leonard." 
you know, and I, I, I think that's true too. It wasn't entirely underrated, but it probably didn't get the kind of attention it might have had it been on a bigger channel. You know, I was glad it was on the Sundance channel. And then later it was on Netflix. It started getting more attention on Netflix because it was there a few years. And now it's, it's moved. It's moved to AMC plus, which I guess is a new streaming uh, branch of AMC. Right. Wow. Well, anyway, I was very, very sorry to hear about that. Yeah, uh, terrible news. Yeah, but Happen Leonard fans will rejoice to know that uh, Joe is working on a, a new one as we speak. Uh, yep. And maybe we can yep. get into that yep. a, little bit, a little bit later. I'm getting ahead yeah. of myself here, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll, get, yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that one. Let's come back to that. But first, we want to talk about Joe's brand new book, The Donut Legion. Uh, what an yep. in, inspired piece of work. Um, you guys are going to absolutely love this book. And um, as always, we've sent copies to Joe. Uh, we're, we're actually trying to figure out where those books are, but we'll we'll track them down and we'll have signed copies soon. Yeah. Um, everybody watching, I'll try. Well, if I have them somewhere. Let me know if they came, <laughs> if they came here, yeah. they may be in my storage. You know, well, I've got well, so much stuff. I've, I've got, I actually need people to work for me and I can't afford that many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need people doing all this other stuff, you know. Do you actually, to digress just a little bit, you know, we were both friends of uh, Bill Kreider and, uh, yes. you know, Bill Kreider Love had me. just an incredible collection of, uh, of books, you know, paperbacks yes. and, you know, it was almost like a museum yes. to pop culture, wasn't it? Yes, it really was. Uh, I, I remember uh, he, he showed them to me one time and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he pretty much covered everything. And Bill, like me, we were both like fanatic readers, you know. Yeah. And uh, I still am. I, I don't read as much now as I did, say, 10 years ago, but I read more than the average person by far. And Bill and I were both big readers and, and we hit it off because we'd always read the same stuff. And we'd, uh, we liked the same kind of music and movies and things like that, where there were some areas where we differed for sure. He was a little bit uh, more golden age tolerant than I was. <laughs> I liked some of that stuff. And I, in fact, I've been reading some, but it's not my, my favorite. I, I'm, I sort of really like crime fiction when you get to uh, the Chandler or Hammett Chandler, yeah. James Kane era, that's more my stuff. But you know, I read all those other guys. I read uh, uh, Ellery Queen. I, I, I read uh, the Perry Mason books. I read, you know, all that stuff. So I was, I, I wanted to be versed in it. I always thought if I'm going to write in this field, I want to know what was considered good and, and then what was considered bad or even mediocre. But when I got to uh, Hammett and all them, then I branched into gold medal novels. Yep. And uh, like, you know, Elliot Chaz, uh, Black oh, Wings has my angel and yeah. uh, all those things. And I just, you know, I, I went nuts. But Bill, he had all those things. He had read them all. He's one of the, he and his wife, um, they were uh, among the best human beings out there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What a loss. I, but I was just thinking they're, about they're the, lost because they're just such good people. They really yeah, good people. Yeah. Um, and then you know, we could talk about Neil Barrett. We could go off on all these different tangents, but about yeah. books, books in general, you mentioned your 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 stuff. Do you have a, a massive library or where do you keep all your books? I, I do, and, and I'm sitting in it right now. Uh, but I also have an entire I had two storage buildings, and I finally said this is just ridiculous. And uh I, I moved some of them here, but I also got rid of about, I don't know, I think two or 3,000 books over the year. Last few years, I've been putting them at half price and, and yeah. you know, not the thing, the things I'm not in love with. And uh, um, I'm probably going to get rid of more. I had a flood that took care of 2,000 of them for me. So oh, no. I think my last one, I had 21,000 books, but a lot of those were like paperbacks, you know, and obviously, okay. I, although I've read extensively, I had not read all 21,000. But I would collect all like the ace doubles because I read a bunch of those. But I collected all of them. I saw I collected all the gold medal. I saw all those like the ace, uh, you know, crime doubles and singles. And so I had all those things because when you're young, you think I'll live long enough to read all these. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but, you know, it's what's really weird is my basic library here is like people said, hey, have you really read all these books? I said, well, no, but I started looking around. I'd read about two thirds of them. And, uh, and I, I was born with an ability to read fast without speed reading. I was always very, very fortunate with that. I have real good hand-to-eye coordination in martial arts. I've got, 
the ability to read this stuff. You know, those are my superpowers that, that I got by, by genetics, not by any, any design or anything I learned how to do. I just read fast. And I used to be able, I'm not so good now, but I used to be able to read stuff and quote back pages and things like that. And, you know, I used to make people, okay, page 41, you know, what, what's, and I could, I could do at least a, a portion of it. It wasn't, a, I don't have a photographic memory by any means, but I had an extraordinarily good one. And I still have a, a good one for a 71 year old man, probably. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. One of the things that Joe and I always enjoy talking about and we share, we collect, you know, kind of forgotten, the forgotten novels, you know, forgotten noirs. You mentioned Black Wings ha has my angel, yeah. you know, that's, that's definitely one. But th those are some of those are being resurrected, you know, like what was the one? Well, they are resurrected. Black Wings is in print, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful edition from uh, New York Review of Books. Um, yeah, well, the first so, edition I read was like this terrible, almost Xeroxed edition that somebody was selling, and they were using the photograph of the old one. So I, I bought know. it because I, I thought that. it was, and I thought it was a reprint. But when I got it, it was just like this Xerox thing. But I've gotten a better edition now. Yeah, there was somebody that was bootlegging the hell out of the <laughs> out of those old books. Um, yeah, you, yeah. You, what is it? You play the black and the red comes up, or the red comes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another good one. There's, there's. That is a good one. I, yeah, I hadn't thought about that one in a while. I read that many years ago. Uh, yeah. That's kind of bleak. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Elliot Chaz's book, uh, Black Wings, my uh, have has my angel. I think maybe about the bleakest. <laughs> it, if it's not, it's close. I, he makes Jim Thompson look like a cheery guy, you know. Um, yeah, and, and I love Dan Marlowe. Dan Marlowe, man, he wrote some hard, hard-boiled books. He sure and, did. Uh, amazing. He had a period there when he was at at his peak. You know, I think he had a stroke and that messed him and up. And then he, he, he came he back. He got amnesia and he forgot his. Yeah, forgot his well, I think it was maybe stroke related. And, and uh, you yeah. know, he was, uh, he had the uh, writer I'm trying to. Oh, yes, yeah. Newsbomb. Yeah, and he taught him how to write again, and he lived with Newsbomb. And then once he learned how to write again, <laughs> they didn't get along. Either. Right. And so, you know, but I, I mean, that would be weird, you know, just you don't know who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I read a Fred Brown book like that called We All Killed Grandma. And in that, my, that was the guy, he, he had a psychological amnesia, you know. Yeah. That's one of my favorite titles in crime fiction, by the way. We oh, all yeah. grandma. <laughs> okay, all right. It's a good Sorry, book. folks. We I, can I love Fred Brown. This. Yeah, Frederick. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, that is a good segue for us to get into this book. And I think um, yeah. because, you know, one of the things about Frederick Brown is that I don't know if he could tell a straight st story to save his life. You know, I mean, there are all yeah. these elements of elements of weirdness thrown in. And, you know, Frederick. Yeah, Brown's like Night story. of the Jabberwock. <laughs> yeah. There, he did a lot of these late at night in the laboratory and then something crazy happens <laughs> kinds of stories. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But let's talk about, let's talk about donut Legion. Um, there's so okay. much going on in this book. You know, it, it, it reminds me of, of a, an homage in some ways to classic fifties and sixties science fiction. It pulls from those yep. influences. Um, yep. There's an awful lot of very pointed social commentary on what, on what's going on right. now. Um, and then it's about writing in some ways. It's about two brothers. Yeah. Can you, can, right. can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah. I, and, you know, one of the things I would say, it was it kind of my nod to Fred Brown when I, when yeah. I wrote it, because uh, he's an author I go back to a lot. There are authors that you like. My favorite mystery writer is Fred Brown, although my favorite, uh, you know, I'm more hard boiled is like Chandler or something like that, because I consider him different. Fred Brown was somewhere in between that. But that I was sort of, a, you know, I, I wrote with him in mind and said, I'm going to try to have a feel like Fred Brown had when he was, you know, when he was cooking. Mine's very different from Brown, but at least that was a, an influence. And I wanted to say something about what I, th I think of as sort of this idiocy of people getting involved with these in incredible conspiracies that make no sense. Or there, you know, I, people say, you know, this guy that that talked them into this, this is the bad guy. But you know what? you got to kind of wear a badge for stupidity too. You know, yeah. if you're easily that in, easily influenced, I, I, I'm not really in your corner that much. You know, it's, I always thought, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, 
the 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 guys the the heavens what was it heavens, heaven's gate, gate, people heaven's that, gate yeah yeah i always thought what a waste of nikes you know i i never could understand why people could be that easily convinced i mean bless them i know they had families and all that but you know what stupid needs to claim stupid and the ones that bother me the most are the ones that really aren't stupid people but they are yeah. what i call the happily stupid they embrace brace ideas that you know you think what the hell? And I, I don't really care about all your emotional problems as to why you did that, because we have to all live. We all, you know, life's just full of little disappointments for, for all of us. And I sometimes think, do, really, do we really need need this? And mm. are you that easily convinced and gullible that somebody's coming on the hell bop comet in a spaceship to pick your ass up? And then when it looks like it's not, you're going to poison yourself because now it's a soul thing. Somewhere in there, I'd go, you know, I think I'd get fucked over. It would have, it would have, I think so. It, it would occur to me that I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, you know, misled at least at some point. And uh, so I don't know. I, I, I guess it's people that, you know, I should feel more sorry for than I do. And I, and I do on one level, but on another level, you know, you got to claim stupid if you're if you're doing it you got to claim it because that's one of the problems there's no guilt there's no shame anymore used to a little bit of guilt was good and some shame was good you didn't need to be guilty about everything shameful about every everything right. but we're missing a little of that we need some of that so, to, so people will and embracing q one of the you know that makes heaven's gate look look practical you know it's well, just there, bizarre some of some of them are kind of quaint and i kind of like them just because they're so crazy I mean the yeah. pizza, the pizza parlor, whatever the hell that was all about. Oh, you got you to yeah, like. But that. you know the guy takes a gun because he is I this know. the one you talk about that they were like abusing kids in the basement of the the Hillary Clinton connection. They were uh, supposed to be abusing kids in the basement of this pizza parlor. And there was no basement, and but the idea that somebody could go, yeah, that makes sense. And they that's got to be happening. Yeah. And then there was there was yeah. a there was a nod to Bubba Hotep, isn't there? In one of them, that JFK Jr. is still alive. Uh, yes, yes, or something yes, like yes. that. Like that's some weird. <laughs> yeah, that twist. was part of QAnon. They were waiting for him to show up, and you know he didn't make it. He was busy, uh, and uh, so they were all. But it was also weird. My, the one that I really love, there's a couple of them, is that there there's these lizards have taken over, and they're disguised as humans. I, like I mean, that. if something's wrong, my first thought, it must be lizards. Lizard you know? people. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, I don't get that. And, uh, you know, the other one was that Trump was still in the White House disguised as Biden, but it was really Trump. And just some all this QAnon stuff, just kind of whatever you wanted it to be. And I'm sure some people were just having fun with it along for yeah. the ride. But there were a lot of people who were damn dead serious. And uh, I think that kind of stuff's scary. I, I think uh, embracing it and I think not calling it out is accepting the idea that we all are are stupid and that we all should embrace stupid things and that we should say if you want to embrace something that damn dumb go ahead and i don't have any problem with it as long as it's not hurting somebody but like the guy that the pizza gate as they called it he showed up with a gun yeah because he thought yeah he thought he was going to have to shoot somebody and then i was just checking it out well i you know i i, I just, i'm sorry i don't have any sympathy for him no kidding gosh yeah um yeah. Well, I, yeah, and, and so it was in the air. Yeah, it was in the air when I was right. Besides the Fred Brown thing, I, you know, you can't help. I, I think I'm always somebody that's connected to what's going on around me and yeah. going on in, you know, uh, I guess in, in the ideas, the social issues. And so it came out, but it also came out funny because there's a part of me that can't look at that stuff and not be amused, sadly. Yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit about, um, I couldn't help think, you know, but think, have you read uh, Jeff Gwynn's new book about Waco? No, I haven't. I like yeah. Jeff Gwynn a lot. Excellent. Excellent. And um, read it. Yeah. It, I couldn't help but think of, of Waco and, and various other of these cults that share so much in common, you know, this sort of apocalyptic. Uh, yeah. Well, that's part it, of it. It's, it's, it's tied to a, uh, um, a dark side of, of religion, generally, you know, generally Christianity, uh, at least in this country, not always, but generally. And, and it's also interesting how many cults are tied to science fictional ideas of aliens coming to rescue us or that we're going to have to deal with them, the lizards or whatever. But it's like people who grew up on all these television shows that never 
you know, or never had a practical moment in their life. And they go, yeah, that makes sense. And um, I, I just look at that and it, 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 like I say, it used to horrify me. Now I have to be amused or I just go crazy. Well, didn't, uh, uh, oh God, L. Ron Hubbard start out as a pulp writer for? Uh, yeah, he, he wrote, he, he wrote Typewriter in the Sky and he wrote a number of other uh, Slaves of Sleep. And, you know, he was always kind of a mediocre writer, but John Campbell embraced him and John Campbell was the editor for Astounding, which, you know, late, later became Analog. But he was caught up in all that. And a lot of it, too, is that not only was this whole thing about there is nothing really wrong with you, be it mental or physically, mental or physical, if you can, um, you know, find this moment to look inside yourself and see those problems. And if you have cancer, it's your fault. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're just not you're not clear. And so people's holding cans. I'm, I mean, I always like, I always try to imagine Tom Cruise holding the two cans. It just, it amuses me to think of that. But I just thought, here's this guy, you know, L. Ron Hubbard and, and, and John Campbell, one of the great editors of science fiction. And even Heinlein was peripherally involved in that too. And, and, really? and a, a Von Vogt, yeah, Von Vogt was a big uh, proponent of it. And in fact, a lot of it came out of Von Vogt more than even than Hubbard, because he was doing that idea of the secret Superman. You know, a guy gets into some terrible situation and finds out he's got abilities that he didn't know. And uh, that was sort of that extrapolated times 10. And L. Ron Hubbard I, was just a con man. That's all he was. You know, he, he had done, done a number of other cons. He had a biography that was absolutely ridiculous, things that he had done that you couldn't have done if you'd lived 300 years, you know. And, uh, but people were, you know, there's always somebody gullible enough. It's, it's different than getting fooled if somebody says, I'm going to come up and do your driveway. I got a really good deal here. And you find out they just spray it with oil and go home. Well, anybody can be con that way, but a continuous con where you embrace idiocy is, is, a, is a whole nother thing, you know? Cause I seem like there's some place inside of you going, you know what? This doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, and also I, I always ask you about this, but Nacogdoches, you know, is such an interesting place. You know, I, um, I've never mm -hmm. been there, only been there through your work, but wasn't it a crossroads of, um, of uh, medicine yep. shows? Spanish, and, French, Native yeah. Americans, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Anglos, every, everybody, you know, they, they were, I think we had six flags, including uh, the Confederacy. Uh, you know, there were six flags over Texas, and I believe that was one of them. I, I know it was. It was one of them. And we had the Fredonia Rebellion, where a guy tried to take over, you know, the uh, Texas and, and, and to, to, I guess, to kind of rule Texas. And uh, But it's, it's an interesting place. As Davy Crockett stopped there on his way to the Alamo. They asked him to be a politician, and he turned it down. I bet when the Mexicans were coming over the wall, he thought, I really should have taken that, <laughs> taken that politician job, yeah. <laughs> you know, because... Uh, yeah, and the Marx Brothers got started there. You know, they they were a singing group, and they uh, uh, the old Opry House is still there. You know, where they performed, and uh, there was a mule fight out in the lot, and they were such bad singers that everybody went out and watched the mule fight. And so when they came back, watched the mules kicking each other, and when they came back, the Marx Brothers started making fun of Nacogdoches full of roaches and stuff like that, and it it caught, and people thought they were really funny. And uh, Groucho talks about it in, I think it's Why a Duck, if I remember right. Really? And uh, so if without Nacogdoches, you don't have the Marx Brothers, you know. So would, would there be a lot of, you know, traveling medicine shows and uh, revival? Yeah, back in the past, like sure. Even when I was a kid and when I lived in Mount Enterprise, I remember faintly not a, a, a sort of like bread truck design thing that came and they let the back down and they were selling, you know, this weird medicines and stuff like that. And it was part of a show too, but they were dead serious about what they were selling. I remember seeing that when I was a kid and it, it didn't strike me odd because I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know anything else. People were still using mules to plow and you would see people, you know, especially uh, black uh, farmers because they didn't always be able to afford like a tractor or something like that. And they would have the mules in the back of the old uh, feedlot you had a turnaround where you could turn the mule around. That's why a lot of towns in, in places, especially Texas, had that big circle because you had to take that yeah. mule all, all horses all the way around if they were pulling a wagon. You know, you, you couldn't like, you know, back, back it up <laughs> like, a, <laughs> like a car, you know. So there's a lot of that stuff that's, uh, 
it, that's fascinating to me about the, the small towns in Texas. And there's always that that undercurrent of the past. You know, what was it? What was it? Uh, Faulkner said that, you know, it's uh, it's not in the past, not even the past. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, still right. it's still what it is. Yeah. Right. And here's much more progressive now than it was 10 years ago. But progressive here is, is a little different than uh, maybe somewhere else, you know. <laughs> so um, I imagine you had an awful lot of fun coming up with the origin story of this particular it's it's a it's a flying saucer cult yeah that uh raises money through all sorts of donut shops in town donuts, you know, and um yeah. and various other businesses and it's just a wonderful setup uh th- yeah can you talk about about coming up with the ezra bacon yeah you know one of the things uh, and i think it's true of everywhere but here there's donut shops everywhere and in fact, uh, a lot of them were owned by uh, Cambodians and they came here and opened donut shops. And there was a guy who would buy all the sugar up and he would control the donuts and they had the donut wars. In fact, he ended up going to prison because he was bringing people in and essentially it was slavery. He was bringing them in from Cambodia and they couldn't afford anything. So he just put them to work. And the shops are still here. I, I, I like to think that's all changed. I good grief us hope so but he went to prison for it but these donut shops are amazingly successful and they're they're everywhere I mean you get up I had a, my agent was going to surprise me by having donuts delivered on the day the book came out and he called and there were so many donut shots but I lived so far out of town they didn't deliver <laughs> so that was uh but it was interesting that there were that many donut shops here and the other thing is, is that I'm sorry. Are they all independent or are some they of them are chain, but there are independent ones. The, the, if you didn't work for this particular guy or maybe not related to him, then you were on your own. And uh, if he owned the sugar, well, you're going to pay a little more than, than maybe the other donut shops, you know, at least these are the, the stories about them. And I know some of them are true. I, you know, I try not to get too much in that, but also out um, in Nacogdoches, there's a place called Mound Street, which used to be nothing but, you know, uh, Native American mounds with the caddos and their, you know, their, their, the pre caddos and all of them, there's only one mound now. And it's, there's a tree on it and a house behind it because they scraped all the others down to the earth, but they still call it mound street. And if you go out to Alto, there is, there are mounds. There's an incredible caddo section there of, of where the caddo Indians lived and built these giant mounds. So I love all that stuff. I was in anthropology and archaeology. I love it. And uh, so when I saw those mounds and I thought about it, that also helped birth some of the ideas about what's underneath that mound. And I thought, well, what if it's a flying saucer? Because I remembered invaders from Mars where they would hit underground and they would, you know, just kind of slide underground and burn a little hole and build and build these caverns underneath. And and so that, that's always stuck with me as one of my favorite images as a kid I was watching that film, the original one. And uh, so all that came together for me. And then just the day-to-day BS of these people believing all these incredible conspiracies. It's not one conspiracy. It's, it's every conspiracy. You know, every conspiracy that comes along, somebody latches on it in some way. Mm-hmm. And I just thought we are going through a time when we're, we're extremely gullible, a lot of really smart people, but a lot of really dumb ideas that people are grasping. And I, I think, Part of it is people are bored. I think that a lot of people don't know what to do with themselves. And I think within COVID, it was even worse. Mm. But I think it's, and you know, I'm, I'm going to segue a little bit because this will sound weird, but I really think this is a lot of it. When advertising came along in the 1950s and, and Fred Brown, a lot of these other authors of that era, everybody worked in advertising nearly in their stories. You know, the man in the a gray Fred flannel Brown. suit, you know, Sloan Wilson. And uh, then you had the man in the gray flannel shroud by Henry Schleser. So you even had it bleed over into other things, you know? And I think that they were selling stuff and what they were doing, they were just about, you need this. And I think it finally got to the point, and especially with things like the Kardashians and all of that idiotic stuff, which is not even real lives or just people making money, you know, making money on being famous, nothing else. People start thinking they need these things or that they deserve these things. And why don't I have them? It must be, a, you know, some reason like a conspiracy or something. 
So that's what I think, you know, and I think that that makes people want more. It makes people unhappy. It makes people say, why don't I have, you know, a big butt and a nice suit like the Kardashians, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with me. Right. And so I, I just think it's a, uh, it's one of those diseases that we try to respond to by finding something to entertain ourselves like a, uh, an everyday soap opera. Cause that's all the, the, the whole thing is, is, you know, the, the Trump administration and, and all of the, uh, the weird QAnon stuff is just a soap opera and people either truly believe it or they embrace it enough that they want to believe it. And, you know, there's that old thing that Vonnegut said, you know, be careful what you pretend to be because of, you know, that's who you turn out to be in time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a lot of it. I know that's a segue and, and I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me, but uh, that's my, that's my theory and I'm sticking to it. That's all right. I mean, there's also a nice little commentary that you're, um, We'll talk about the two brothers here. Let's get into it. Charlie yeah. and Felix, these these brother right. characters. Um, uh, Charlie's uh, former had a brief stint as a private investigator and now is a writer. Um, and his brother, his brother, it was a psychiatrist, and has become a private investigator. Um, and and they're yeah, he lacked empathy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's a but there's a great comment in here about how I think I think Felix, the brother, makes it about how, you know, and I, I've heard a lot of people echo this, that the far right extremism and the far left e extremism are basically the same thing. They yeah. are. They're the same thing. If you go far enough either way, you meet back here. Yeah. They're the same people. I mean, you used to you had like the right, the far right. We're going to, you know, have uh, Huckleberry Finn and Vonnegut and. Fahrenheit 451 by Brad, we're going to have those pulled. Now you got the far left going, we're going to have those pulled. And you know, if Twain could irritate both of them, he was doing something right. Absolutely. And I think we've gotten into this, you, you know, it's, I always, people talk about woke. I always stood up for what they liked. I mean, their whole, whole idea about everybody gets a fair shake and that's for me. But when you start telling me exactly what a fair shake is, or that this is the only kind of language that we can use or this is the only way it can be discussed and you can't do this and huckleberry finn's this terrible terrible thing because this word in there offends people when exactly that word is part of what that story uses to attack racism i always right. think it's interesting at the very first when he refers to uh, the dialects he refers to it as a negro dialect so he was not someone who was just saying i you know this is a word for me and uh I think that people miss, and we've gotten to where we don't have any context. You know, it's not a, it's not context anymore. It's like, I want to be offended. I want to be a victim. I, you know, I, I want a trigger warning. Well, fuck you. I'm not giving you a trigger warning. And, you know, the thing is, is that because I don't know what will trigger you. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that I write about a marmoset and they have a marmoset problem. You know, I don't know. And, and I've always said that life's just full of like little disappointments. And uh, you're going to, if you don't learn to do those, deal with those, when you get outside your Twitter circle, you got real life out there, you know, and it's just not, not going to be that way. You're going to have your little feelings hurt all the time. And it's amazing that when you have colleges that are anybody that offends their sensibilities, they don't want that person there to speak. Uh, they don't want to, you have all these ways of discussing things that don't ever really discuss anything. They just go around in circles because it's a constant fear of offending somebody. And, uh, you know, when you really think about it, writing's not about pretty manners, neither is comedy. You know, it's, there's, there's, there's nuance in things. And sometimes by being right in your face about something negative, you're actually criticizing that. I always think about Richard Pryor, you know, yeah. he, he, he made people think, you know, you go back to uh, Twain, he made people think. Vonnegut, and what to about kill a mockingbird, uh, George Carlin. Yes, George Carlin, one of my absolute favorites. I love George. Carlin. Me yeah. too. I got to see him live a couple times, and it was uh, always a, a treat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's all it should be about you know critical thinking and learning how to think. For critical yourself. thinking, and um, and you can disagree with somebody. You know, yeah. it shouldn't be that every time you you know, it's not like if somebody's out here actually stirring up people to be violent or kill somebody. That's not just an opinion. That's not just voicing an idea. That's something else. But when you have people wanting to pull books out, burn books, uh, don't say gay, you know, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is just beyond belief to me. 
I, I think I feel like I'm living not in the 50s. I mean, in some ways, the 50s were liberal times compared to this. You know, you at least had critical thinking. You, you know, when, when they call uh, McCarthy out and says, have you no shame? That was the end of it for him, pretty much. I mean, there was a, so, some other things that went on. But, when, but now nobody has any shame. So trying to approach them about shame is not it. Shame keeps them in the news. You know, it keeps them in the news. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and it, to ban a, ban a book because the author, not because of what the content of the book, but because the author might have been a shitty human being, you know. <laughs> That's right, too. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, know I, I always mean, say, look, if somebody you just think is doing terrible things to people and they're alive, don't buy their books. But if somebody's been dead for a hundred years or 50 years or whatever, and their books were interesting for what they were, then, you know, you're not punishing that person anymore. Right. And uh, it just, and if, you know, if you can't stand it, don't read it. And uh, if you start reading something of mine and you're offended and, and you just feel that little tear coming in your eye, just close the book. Right. Right. Well, tell us a little bit about these two brothers. We started to talk about them, Charlie and Felix. Where do these guys come from? And why? Brothers? I'm not entirely sure. Why brothers? Well, well, I have a brother, you know, my brother's 17 years older than me. So it wasn't like we played ball together. We, we grew up like, uh, 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 like, you know, like only children, both of us, because we, we were right. I, by the time I was born, he was out. He moved out of the house. We're close, but we didn't have that kind of relationship. But I, for some reason, I thought it would be interesting if they were brothers and that there was this difference between them, but yet they had this familial uh, connection. And I thought that that made it more interesting. Instead of like Happ and Leonard who have become brothers, here's people that are brothers. And uh, they're very different from one another. I mean, there are probably elements where they're the same, but they're very, very different. And they have different lives. They have different expectations. Um, you know, Felix is pretty much a straightforward kind of guy. Uh, but, you know, I think he's kind of funny, but he's, a, he's straightforward. And uh, Charlie is, uh, you know, he's kind of the thinker of the bunch in spite of the fact of Felix having been a psychiatrist because he wasn't, right. he wasn't suited for that work. <laughs> that was not <laughs> something he really should have been doing, you know? Yeah. And I just thought it was a good contrast. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about the, about the, you know, notions of, of brotherhood and friendship and playing yeah, that off with Happen Leonard. Um, but, you know, also uh, in the beginning of the book, um, um, Charlie, you know, I think it's like three o'clock in the morning, he's sitting out on his patio right. And um, someone comes to visit him. Uh, it's yeah. very early on in the book, but it, I mean, it's it's kind of the key scene in the book uh, that gets the whole yep. thing rolling. Um, it is. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I wrote it in such a way that you can kind of look at it in more than one way. Although uh, for me, I think it's clear that it's one thing and, and uh, it's a good story element. It's not necessarily something I would believe personally, but that's not what good storytelling is about. And uh, right. so to me, I also left in the, you know, the fact that for reasons, maybe I don't want to give away in the book that it could well have been a delusion, you know, but because sometimes I've noticed when people will think I, I had this great, you know, premonition, premon premonition. I thought of my, I, when I wrote, uh, read my lips, of Batman, a guy called it a premonition. And I thought that was funny, but premonition. anyway, a uh, premonition and uh, what it is a lot of times, it's just that you've got that person on your mind. There's all kinds of connections and you start looking and you see why you're, why you're thinking this, you know, you know why you're worried about someone, you know, why you put it in these, this kind of formation in your, in your head, you know? So I played with a lot of that, but I just thought it was a, another Fred Brown approach to taking this uh, kind of quirky, opening that could be a visit from a ghost and it could be something else but it definitely starts the ball rolling and so what is it just for the people watching who, who comes to, to visit him is that a spoiler oh, he's his ex-wife his ex-wife ex who who uh, he's still very much in love with and thinks about and uh she's uh you know some, one of these serial not necessarily a serial marrier although that's part of it too but she's always trading one person for another she 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 likes the idea of being in love but once it becomes a daily thing then it's like you know where's all the romance where's all the excitement where's all the joy where's all the mystery she can't deal with essentially what her adult 
situations. She still likes that sort of teenage aspect. And so he, and he knows this and he knows that that's, that's not something that could be worked out with them really, or they, they would have worked it out, but he still loves her because she is a, a very sensual kind uh, person that he has a uh, history with, you know? And I think that that also helps fuel what goes on from there and why he's so, why it's so important to him. And, uh, you know, and then of course he meets another, another lady, but he's still got, feelings for his first wife, even though this other lady is a, a very interesting uh, character and he does come to care about her as well. Scrappy. Scrappy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Amelia Moon, known Amelia as Scrappy. Moon. Scrappy. But not, not Scrappy do. Scrappy. No. Not, 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 no. She'll not, correct Not you. Scooby's nephew. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's quick to correct that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just to say my favorite character in it is actually Tag the dog. I like the dog <laughs> yeah. better than anybody in the book. <laughs> Great character. There is a chip, there's a right chimpanzee there. in here in the book too. Very memorable. Yes, chimpanzee. that's true too. Yeah, and and he likes to. They like to dress him up and make yep. him cute looking. I think little little uh, like cowboy outfits and so on and so on. You know, he's got different little outfits at different times. But uh, chimpanzees, people don't know. They think of them as these little you know, smaller apes that are playful and funny, but they don't realize that when those apes get big, they're kind of like a miniature gorilla. You know, I, I remember I, there's been so many people that had pet chimpanzees that tore their face off. And one of the more famous ones was a lady that had a birthday party for her chimpanzee with her friend. And for some reason, the chimp went crazy and, and jerked her face off. Literally, she had to have a new face. She actually, I think they put, a face transplant because uh, it actually just ripped her face off. I think it ripped her hands off, ripped her face off because they're incredibly strong, unbelievably strong, and they can be horribly vicious. And so they're not exactly a pet or shouldn't be. And when I read that article, it stayed with me. And I thought, what a wreck birthday party. <laughs> 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 and so uh, I figure he never had another. But, uh, you know, that's that's just so strange to me that that people would not think that this beast that's gotten so big. I mean, I can understand having the affection for it because I love animals of all kinds, you know, yeah. I, and uh, but I, I just always stuck with me that that lady had a birthday party for a, a chimpanzee that tore her face off, you know. Yeah, it's comedy gold. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go terror. out, you know, that's the way you want to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, well, it, the Clint Eastwood, uh, right turn Clyde. Was that a chimpanzee? Oh, the orangutan. The orangutan? orangutan. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the uh, visitation from his ex-wife, and by the way, people watching, I'm flying solo here, but I am looking at your notes and uh, Ryan Campbell just won the internet because this with this comment, I like the parallel between ex-wives and ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Folks, if you have questions for Joe, go ahead and put them in and I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, on the notes here because we're streaming on Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. Um, let's see here. But anyway, um, sorry, I got, got distracted. No, no, no. I got distracted. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite books of yours that I wanted to bring up, just kind of, I grabbed a few in the collection here is uh, this book, and here's a nice limited edition of it, but yeah. it's called Lost Echoes. And um, yeah. you know what's funny, Joe, is that I bring your book up quite often uh, in author discussions because when we get we get off on the on the uh, on the subject of places in fiction where you know traumatic events have occurred or violence has occurred, right. and you know. Is there a residue of that, of that, you know, or if you go to, you know, you go to Gettysburg or you go to, uh, you know, yeah. the little Bighorn, you know, is there yeah, been to all those places? Yeah. 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 And there's, I don't know if there's a, any kind of through line between these two, but you know, there is a metaphysical hint in both. Well, there's a, I, I think it's a, there's a metaphorical idea of it. I think that if you went there and didn't know there'd ever been a battle there, you'd probably never occur to you. <laughs> I, I think we create our own, own uh, sort of 
I guess, metaphysical mysteries. I'm not a big believer in the, the uh, supernatural or the, the other world or anything like that. I want to be, but I just never find much that's very convincing. You know, um, I, I much more believe the, the chimpanzee would wear those suits on his own before I would believe, you know, that there's all this going on. But it's, it's great storytelling stuff. It's yeah. great, wonderful stuff. In Lost Echoes, the guy has a, 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 an ear infection that leaves him with the ability to hear, hear sounds in the past and then to create the images from the sounds. And uh, that idea just came from uh, my friend, uh, Tara Lee Langford, also a good writer. Uh, he and I were in, uh, I think we were in Houston and he was having, I think a book signing or doing something with, with uh, you know, his books. And uh, I ended up staying at a hotel where he was staying because he ended up with two rooms. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that room. Thanks, man. So I laid there all night. It was just this horrible racket. You know, there was, you, you know, you could hear trucks coming along. Uh, uh, you know, you could hear illegal aliens uh, banging around in the back of these, these trucks. And, 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 you know, people were just, you know, making constant noise and uh, I couldn't sleep. And then I got up and realized the goddamn window was open. All I had to do was close the window. Uh -oh. But by that time it was morning but this idea of all of these sounds and all these imagined stories i had you know and uh I, I was always you know i was always scared that there were people being transported in the back of trucks that would be left and forgotten you know because that just seemed like the worst idea that you're in some truck you can't get out you yeah. know and and they were they had you know human trafficking like that and so anyway all those sounds sort of created that that idea and so that's how Lost Echoes came about. That in martial arts, which I've done my whole life. Are you still as, as involved with martial arts as ever? Not as involved, but I teach every week. And, and this yeah. week I didn't because I had this tonight. I usually teach on uh, Wednesdays and I oh. teach a private class. And then if I'm not there, I've got my guy, you know. So uh, right. and then I have the other branch of the system is taught by uh, other people of mine that have gone on to you know, be in the martial arts for many years. Right. Right. But I'm still doing it. I'm still training in it. Joe, uh, Joe did a, we did a little, not, not a really a demonstration, but I asked Joe to, to show me a move or two in the back room and folks, it was terrifying. Um, <laughs> it was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and there are a couple of really good videos uh, on, online that you can watch and you can see Joe demonstrating a couple of your tactics it's very, very up close and, and quick. And yeah. And, and, you know, if you look at those, you could say, well, what if he did that? Well, you know, you got to learn how to do this before you can learn how to do that. It's, it's like the ABCs. I'm showing you A and B. I'm not trying to show you the whole alphabet in, in those right. things, but there is a whole alphabet and sometimes it fails you. But more often than not, you're a little better advantage if you've actually learn that alphabet it's just like everything else you learn the a's and b's and so on so that you can put sentences together as in paragraphs of uh of techniques i'm just folks that are watching i'm just i just put a link forgive the uh the shameless uh product placement but um here we are talking about joe's new book and we we will have signed copies shortly i just put a link in the comments field in on uh, facebook and youtube should you wish to purchase okay. one? And we would definitely appreciate the support. Um, let's see here. Okay, let, let me just ask some of these questions um, from the, from the right. audience. Uh, somebody with the name Queso, I like that. Uh, any comments on the production of The Bottoms? Well, when Bill died, that kind of killed that. Bill um, Paxton, you know, he was the one that was gonna direct it. Um, I'm out there with it again for a while. I just didn't want to do anything with it. Cause I was just so, you know, heart, heart sick because I, yeah, I, I love Bill a lot. He was a good, he was a good friend. And you know, the thing is, is there's a lot of people knew him better than I did and known him long. I knew him about nine years, I think, but he was one of those guys that you knew him five minutes and you felt like you were his best friend. He was just one of those guys, you know, and you know what? You probably were all of those people probably were. He was a really sincere, good man. And we had a Texas connection because he was from Fort Worth. We kind of knew, and we both had a lot of, he, he had all those same sayings that I have. I thought, wait, man, that's mine. <laughs> you know, he'd have those funny metaphors and similes. We both, both talked in those things. And so that was, uh, 
uh, that was interesting, you know, because he was known for that in in the acting field. And, and he made up a lot of the stuff that you would see like a game over, man. That was, you know, he made that up in <laughs> Aliens. And uh, uh, he told me, he said, I'll be honest with you, what I do is I would make them up before and I would have them in my head. And so then when the moment came up, <laughs> I would stick it in there. You know? Right. Oh, that's great. Um, what a good guy he was. He sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was a good oh, guy. I, I, a friend in Italy, uh, a young lady named Stefania, who watches okay. one of our program, really cool lady. Uh, she says, Mr. Patrick, can you ask Mr. Lansdale if he remembers a crazy girl who was crying in front of him when he went in the city of, is it Ravenna in Italy last year? I do. I do. <laughs> I, I, th I, th I thought I thought she'd been hurt somehow. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. That never occurred to me. The other. I do. Lovely person. Yeah, Lovely person. Yeah. One of the best Very memories sweet. of my life. Yeah. 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 Your book, your well, I remember really, you. <laughs> your books do really, uh, really well in, in Italy in particular. Right. And in, in France yeah. and other yeah. countries. Yeah. Well, other places. But Italy is uh, um, the the uh, for foreign sales. Italy is the most um I, I guess you would say it's the most successful per capita you know because uh this united states is so much bigger but italy you know people recognize me on the street uh really? I'm, i you know i've been yeah I, I i was over there early in my career and i would see myself on magazines on the rack and stuff and i would go wow that's weird <laughs> it's gotta <laughs> you know? be kind of surreal and, uh, yeah 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 there was a magazine vogue and uh, I was in that. And I told Casey, I said, well, I beat you being in Vogue. She said, what were you in Vogue for? I said, well, Speedos, of course. She was like, Daddy, no. <laughs> no, they just did a, a photo in an interview, I think. <laughs> it is kind of funny, um, uh, you know, watching some of the interviews um, when you're in, in Europe somewhere. And it's always, you're always listening for the translation and then responding. Uh, and you must do yeah. that all, all over yeah. Europe, right? Yeah, 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 you do. And, uh, you know, uh, Germany, France, uh, you know, you name it, all the different places you go to, you do that. But sometimes what's fun is you'll go to a place where there's like a university or something. I, I think one of the places, the University of Rome, I gave a lecture or something. But you also have places where a lot of people speak English and they're studying English and they're studying English literature, maybe, or something of that nature. And so that, that can be a little easier. But sometimes you think you're making yourself clear and they're understanding it, but they're not interpreting it. And, you know, they're doing far better than I can do. I, I can't, you know, I can order a, a, a cafe Americano and that's about it. You know, that's that a cafe Americano. But um, they do wonderful. I mean, they're, they're far better at language than we are. That's that's for sure. You know, but it is funny sometimes how things can be misinterpreted and misunderstood. It's funny, our mutual friend, uh, James Salas, Jim Salas, yeah. also, uh, you know, he's also big over in Europe, you know, and um, yeah, we, he, we met in Italy. Did no, you really? no, I think I met him actually in, in, in Scottsdale, I think either or Phoenix, they had some yeah. kind of thing there and, and Dutch totally. Leonard was there and Bill yeah. Kreider, I forget, but, but, but we may have met kind of in passing, but we spent a lot of time together in Italy. My daughter was over there singing, you know, she was in part yeah. of this. Thing. And and Jim plays blues and but yeah. they also crossed it with uh, literature and so it was a real interesting thing and that's that's how I got to know him and his wife they're great people well, why can't they do that here in this country <laughs> I know yeah um, let's see yeah Margaret Westlake um, says oh yeah any relation to the great Donald Westlake but uh, I play board games on an online forum and the Italians online always know who Joe is when I ask <laughs> often also Casey. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. She uh, had a following for, for her music over there. Yeah. Really? Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. She performed over there. Yeah. Okay. Judy would like to know what's Joe's favorite kind of donut. Oh, I try not to eat them. I actually had one on the day the donut legion came out. My wife and I had a donut and it was the only one I could find in, in at Walmart because the donut shops closed at 11. <laughs> so <laughs> I bought us one, a piece of donut. It was a frosted uh, cake donut, but I don't think I, I, anything with chocolate on it. I like a donut with chocolate. Yeah. Okay. Classic. 
Um, Classic. Now, you know, the, the local Dairy Queen often figures in your work. Um, when was the last time you actually had a, anything from a Dairy Queen? <laughs> when he, quite a few years ago. I actually was a secret shopper for Dairy Queen back in the 90s. And uh, what happened is that my wife was uh, wanting to quit her job and I, I was doing pretty well as a writer, but I was nervous about it. So I thought, well, I'll have this as a side thing. So I would go to different towns and go in and buy a DQ do is what they had me doing. And I would taste it to make sure it was good. Then I'd go check, make sure the bathrooms were clean and the lights work. And then I would fill out a little form and then they would pay me, but they would take so long to pay me. And it was such a small amount. I said, you know, what am I doing? Because <laughs> you know? I've always was, I, I kept all my janitor materials. So in case I had to go back to be a janitor, uh, you know, I, I had this thing going. I, I taught at the university and was, hoping that, you know, well, what if things go bad? I'll have to do that. And one day I looked up and I thought, you know what, what am I worried about? I, <laughs> I'm well enough off. I've, I've got enough that I don't need to be worried about going back to the aluminum chair factory. But I think coming from being poor has a lot to do. I Dean Koontz once said to me, once poor, always poor. And uh, there's a certain truth to that. I think some people are more fanatic about it than others, but uh, I'm very happy happy you know i'm not rich but i'm i'm comfortable you know quite comfortable and you and you can do you know whatever you you want to do you know pretty much pretty much and you know i've got great kids and they're both in the industry now my my son's a, a stockbroker and he writes screenplays and has, has had a couple of movies made uh from either co co-writing or, or his own and uh right now we he wrote a script from my story the projectionist which I'm supposed to direct if that works out. And that's looking better all the time. And uh, that would be my first directorial and probably my last if I, if I do a bad job of it. But I, I want to do that one. I, I feel very certain that I can do it. I understand directing enough to do it. And I know I'm smart enough to know what I don't know and to hire people to help me, you know? Right, right. Well, this is- Good uh, DP, you know, things like that. Yeah, well, that's kind of a good segue for this question. This is a first uh, for me anyway, probably not for you. Ryan, um, he says, I'm here for a grade for my English comp class. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I usually read nonfiction, which is based on a lot of research. Uh, I was just wondering, how much research do you do for your books? I don't do much conscious research. I'm, a, you know, you and I trade books like on the Old West and yeah. different things like that. You know, we're like, yeah, hey, have you read this? And so it's stuff that I've read that I'm interested in that then will sometimes develop into the fiction. So it's not necessarily conscious research, although I may go back to it to find a date or, a, or an incident, to, you know, square it up with what I'm writing. But most of my research is just out of my own reading experience. Let's see. Um, let's see. I, I, I can't pronounce the name. It's but anyway, the question is, after hearing your sharing, I really wonder about your mindset before uh, starting to write a book. Uh, how is the process? I get up, I go upstairs and I start writing. That's it. That's and, you it. know, I, well, I get up and I have, I have breakfast and I feed the dog, you know, the dog's got to be fed and got to go out. But after I do that, then, uh, I usually have like, uh, you know, Cheerios or <laughs> something like that. And I bring it up here to the desk where I'm sitting right now with a cup of coffee. And, uh, I will kind of look at the day's headlines. I don't watch TV. I don't even have news channels anymore. Got rid of them. And uh, I read the headlines and then I go in to look at my email, make sure there's nothing there that I, you know, don't need to answer. Then I go to Facebook and do some promotion there and answer people that write me. And that all takes about 30 minutes, you know, and maybe 30 minutes for the dog and breakfast. And so then I start, I start writing. I usually write about three hours and either that three to five pages is my limit. But I like today I did nine. I did nine pages uh, this morning. And sometimes it has to do with it being more dialogue than others. And then sometimes I'm just, you know, I'm just cooking, but um, I polish it as I go. So when I get done, when I have to go back and, and, you know, go over the book, I don't have as much to do. I don't, I'm not really doing a second draft. I'm doing one draft and a polish. But if you think about how much you throw away in the sense, you're not really putting it in the trash can, but you're correcting it constantly on the computer. I'm actually probably doing a lot of drafts in a single day of that particular segment I'm working on. There's a, a, a point in the book here. Uh, there are some neat little comments about writing and the writing life. And 
and you you talk about that you know you can't wait for the muse you are the muse you know yeah you're it yeah, yeah. this may be controversial I mean, some people believe it's some sort of spiritual thing or whatever and more power to them but yeah. i believe it's you you know you have to show up and go okay it's time to go to work and the thing is is that the more you do it the more the muse shows up <laughs> the more you write the easier it is to do i mean it's never easy easy but you know i i mostly have fun when I write and uh, I try to write well. I'm very interested in style. I'm interested in dialogue. I'm interested in humor and I don't slap dash. I try to write as well as I can. Sometimes I'm experimental. You know, I'll write sentences and somebody calls it a run on and I call it, no, it's not a run on sentence at all. Uh, you know, it's a stream of consciousness. And so, you know, I do, I, I borrow a lot of things from other kinds of literature to play with when I'm doing those things because I just like it. I, I love reading and I love experiencing writers and their different me methodology for telling a story. Peso would like to know, he says, can you talk for a moment about events concerning? Oh, that was fun. Uh, the events concerning a nude foldout found in a Harlequin romance I wrote back in the 90s. And I wrote it for an anthology Karen and I were editing. And the deal was I had, had to do a story for it. And so I said, okay, so I wrote that and uh, uh, it won the Bram Stoker. And so then I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. I like those characters. And I never wrote another thing about them until last year. And uh, uh, Subterranean Press, Bill, you know, he asked me, he said, would you uh, think about writing another story about these characters? So it's kind of a novel, short novel. So I did uh, the events concerning two stabbed clowns in a bloody bathtub. And uh, that was kind of the sequel to it. And it picked up just like it, you know, it's just like I hadn't left those characters at all. Um, I would like to do one more, you know, uh, the, the events concerning the one leg dog, one leg dog or something like that. I forget. Oh, the, the, of the uh, curious disposition of the one leg dog. And uh, I would like to write that one. Uh, but they were fun. They were just characters I went back to. And in some ways, I think they were forerunners of Happen Leonard. I really? think they taught me a little bit of that. And, you know, if you look at it, the same DNA is kind of there that are in Happen Leonard and the same with uh, Felix and, and Charlie. They're all different, but there's a, a kind of DNA that I wanted to be there. I wanted there to be a certain East Texas connection. I wanted people to feel that, you know, that there was a, a symmetry between these characters. And there's, you know, uh, Casey's, Casey's bailing on you, by the way. She says, thanks for doing this, Patrick. Bye, Daddy. Sushi calls. <laughs> So she's going up for sushi. sushi calls. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame her. I do yeah. sushi first. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Online. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. But I just, um, you're always, it's always such a fun time talking with you. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you mentioned, um, you know, the characters in the new book and uh, Amelia Moon, Scrappy, the, the female character yeah. that's the writer. Um, a classic Lansdale character in many ways. You know, you have yeah. written about so many headstrong, um, you know, just kick-ass female characters, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, true. I love, I love strong female characters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Scrappy to me too, though, was I just thought she was eccentric and interesting, you know, just the whole thing about sandwiches have to have chips. You know, you got <laughs> sandwich, you yeah. got to have a chips. And, and uh, just all these little bitty things and, and the whole thing about the ant farm, you know, it's just this bizarre viewpoint she had about, the, about the ant farm. And uh, I just thought that she was an interesting character and she wasn't based on anybody in particular, but I just, you know, different people I borrow little things from. I've had those kind of conversations with people like, I think, are we on the same channel here? <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm kind of following you, but I think, I think we were tuned into different channels. You know, and so I, I thought she was curious and fun. And uh, Tag, I love dogs. I'm an ex absolute fanatic for dogs. I've got my pit bull here near me somewhere. But uh, I, I I loved writing about that dog so much. And, uh, you know, and then then uh, Felix's uh, girlfriend, the lawyer, I liked her too. But she's Cherry. very different than Scrappy. Yeah, Cherry, very different from Scrappy. So I, I'd like a chance to write about them again, I think. I, I believe they're characters that I could return to. And I think they're... Happen Leonard is funny, but I think these guys are lighter than Happen Leonard. But yet there's there's that undercurrent of you know social uh, business going on that is I think more or less gently spoon fed. 
you know, I, and so I kind of kind of enjoyed that. Felix kind of reminded me of your descriptions that you've made of your father. In what, in yeah, what? That, I mean, he was based on my father some. Uh, he was based at, that was one of the big, big things. I, I, uh, my father wasn't as educated as, as Felix, but my father was a moose and he could have bent that iron. I don't know if you remember when, when yeah, Felix yeah. bends that barn back. My father could have done that, you know, and, yeah, and did do that. I mean, I saw him do things. Folks, if you're interested, I won't subject you to this, but I've asked Joe and he's told me some wonderful stories about his dad including a, a, a very memorable one in the garage one day when his father yeah. attended to business. And that's on one yeah. of our, our interviews. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. Yeah. I also turned it into a short story. And most of that story is really just real. There are, there are things I did to make a story called Apollo Red. And it's a half yeah. story. It's in one of the little collections. And also I'm right now, I've, I've sold a memoir and I'm writing that memoir wow. part time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. It's called The Me Mechanic's Son. And uh, I'm working on that. And oh. my dad will, of course, feature in it. But my mother as well, who was also an amazing woman. And, uh, and, and you know, one of the basis for all the strong women I write, my wife, my daughter, my, my niece, Pam, uh, you know, all of these people. Uh, yeah, Pam, I wouldn't want to mess with Pam. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that character. I can't remember her name, but the, the, the vampire one in um, uh, oh, Reba. Reba. Reba, yeah, yeah, the four year old man. Yeah, she's yeah. awesome. Oh, that's yeah, really yeah. exciting about the memoir, Joe. I didn't know that. How cool! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually running behind on it because I, I have to, you, you know, do stuff to finish out contracts. And this is a contract too, but I had a little more time on it. But because I had a little more time, I've gotten a little bit behind. Uh, so I'm hoping that I'll have it finished by the end of the year. That's the plan. They plan to publish it next year. So they said I had to have it finished, but uh, you know, it'll be when it's, when it is, that's all, I, all there is to it. Who's, who's publishing it? Um, I, what do they call themselves? Uh, the name changed. It was originally something else. I think it's called, it's, it's a branch of Stygian Sky, Stygian Sky. Okay. So it's a new okay. publisher. They're doing a comic by Casey and I based on our characters uh, from Terra is our business. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. Yeah, Thomas Kellogg just asked, who's the publisher on the memoir? Exactly. So he just answered yeah. that one for you. Um, let's see here. Well, any, any last thoughts or questions? Um, okay, wait, here's something. Okay. <laughs> um, Valerie, do you usually taunt your readers with tidbits from books you're currently working on? You know, as you've been doing with this latest Happen Leonard book. Huh. <laughs> I know <laughs> who this is. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, thanks everybody for all your questions and comments. Um, uh, let's see. Melba has the final word. Any chance you'll visit DC soon? I wish, you know, that they used to do these tours. They'd send you everywhere, but now they've gotten cheap. And uh, uh, used to, they'd send you on two and three week tours. And I, I think too, just a lot of things about book tours have changed. Absolutely. When I first did them, there weren't, everybody wasn't touring. You know, it was like a handful of us that were touring comparatively to now where everybody was touring. And uh, I think that that had a lot of effect on it. And they would say, well, this is where he does best. But I, I don't know that that's true. I seem to do okay wherever, you know. Yeah, well, you know, and then the whole, the whole, vir we're doing this on a virtual event. And, yeah. um, you know, we've been doing a version of that, you know, for a long time, but nothing like yeah. everybody's done in the last couple of years out of necessity. Yeah, right, and, um, right. You know, it's been- Well, all of my others are in person. All the others I'm doing are in person. God damn it, not this one. Um, anyway, that's too bad. Yeah. But by the same token, here we have people around the world tuning in, which is a really wonderful thing. Yeah, but we're not. But the thing is, when this is over, we're not getting tacos. That's <laughs> true. Well, I might. <laughs> yeah, you might. I, there is I might. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joe, as always, it's been great to talk with you. And yeah. um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And if you don't get it from the poison pen, get it somewhere. New copy of. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I've got this uh, bit of evidence. I was going to ask you, who was the guy, uh, that author who, and I think it's, Whit, is it Whitley 
Streiber or Streber? There's a Whitley Streber. Yeah, yeah. Was he the he one? He was the one that uh, thought claimed. he was kidnapped by aliens or something. Yeah. And he Communion believed- and and uh, yeah. Oh well. Yeah, I think he. I think he did. I mean, I don't honestly know, but uh, and he finally just went over into doing that kind of stuff, you know. And he was a big best-selling horror writer for a time, but his interests were uh, in being kidnapped and uh, talking about aliens, you know, uh, using salad spoons to open his butt or something. I don't know. But anyway, it was uh, it was it went off on a trail that didn't interest me. But he, you know, he did the Wolfen's one of his more famous ones, The Hunger. You know, yeah. they made films out of both of those too. Right. Right. We end on a curious note. But anyway, have a great night, Joe, and we'll talk soon. You too. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. All right. Good night.